In the 1960s, turbine-powered cars drove on the roads of America. In fact, Chrysler Corporation built more than six dozen turbine cars over 25 years and even built a fleet of them in 1963, which they lent to the general public. Yet somehow, this legendary program is largely unknown to most Americans. In the early 1950s, the jet age was just dawning. The turbine engine promised advantages over the piston engine, which had been powering autos since the turn of the century. It had fewer moving parts, and many of those parts would spin rather than reciprocate, which meant a smoother running engine that should last longer. And turbines could run on a wide range of fuels, not just gasoline. People within Chrysler began considering turbine-powered automobiles. George Hubner, an engineer with a degree from the University of Michigan, was fascinated by the promise of turbine power and received permission from Chrysler to begin working on an automotive turbine. Hubner assembled a team of scientists and engineers and began working on the various issues related to putting a jet engine under the hood of a car. By 1953, Hubner's team accomplished the task. They unveiled the car to the press and soon everyone was talking about Chrysler's turbine car. The first car had some minor issues. When it was demonstrated for the press at Chrysler's proving grounds, it would not start on its own. Chrysler engineers started it out of view and drove it past the grandstand packed with newsmen who were none the wiser. They saw a car that looked just like any other car on the road, but they could tell by the whooshing sound it made that it was being powered by a turbine engine. While demonstrating and testing the turbine car publicly, the engineers continued improving the automotive turbine back in the laboratory. Soon, the second generation engine was placed in a car, and then the third. One of the first major problems the Chrysler engineers worked on was how to make the engine more efficient. A turbine engine creates and wastes a lot of heat. The engineers had found a way to recover the heat and, in essence, recycle it through the use of regenerators. As a result, the exhaust was much cooler than one might expect from a jet engine, and the fuel economy was improved. The engineers knew that if the car was to ever be mass-produced, its parts could not be expensive or too complicated to make. They spent time developing special alloys which could withstand the intense heat of the engine, but were also inexpensive. And they managed to make the engine operate with a fan disc which was cast as a single piece. Jet engines built for aviation use often have each blade carefully measured, weighed, and installed one at a time on the discs. That expensive and time-consuming operation would have been cost-prohibitive in the automotive world. George Hubner recognized the value of public relations. Good PR brought free advertising for Chrysler, but it also helped to keep his program in the public eye so Chrysler would be inclined to continue funding the turbine cars. Hubner announced that a turbine car would be driven cross-country. He said that they were testing the vehicle's durability, but there's no question the trip was just as much about getting free publicity. Hubner held a press conference in New York City and then drove west in the turbine car with an entourage of Chrysler support mechanics and engineers in his wake. The drive proved successful and the publicity proved to be a bonanza. As the development continued, a second turbine car was also driven cross-country. Along the way, it stopped at Chrysler dealerships where herds of reporters often met the car and insisted on going for test drives. Chrysler was more than happy to oblige. Consumers often showed up at the car dealerships as well and often asked when the cars would be sold to the public. Seeing the positive public reaction of the turbine cars, Chrysler announced an amazing program. Chrysler would build a fleet of turbine cars and lend them to average Americans to use for free. This would allow for real-world testing, but would also generate a massive amount of free publicity for the company. The response to the announcement was beyond enthusiastic. Soon, thousands of letters flooded Chrysler from around the country as consumers clamored for the use of the turbine cars. Chrysler also decided it would be important for the turbine cars in this program to be distinctive. Chrysler had recently hired well-known designer Elwood Engel from Ford Motor Company. They gave him the task of creating a unique platform for the turbines. Engel created one of the most distinctive and beautiful cars ever to come from Chrysler. The turbine car bodies were created and assembled in Italy by Ghia, a company which made many of Chrysler's show cars and prototypes. There they were crated and shipped to America. An assembly line was set up on a small plant on Greenfield Road and the turbine drivetrain was installed. Although it was almost called the Typhoon, the car was simply labeled the turbine car. Besides its space age lines, the car would sport a unique color. All of the turbine cars in the user program, except for one, would be turbine bronze. The unique paint job made the cars more memorable and easier to spot. 
Chrysler hired a young turbine mechanic named Bill Carey and gave him the job of overseeing the fleet of consumer cars. Often, he was the one who delivered the cars to the users in the program. He handed them the keys and gave them the delivery walkthrough, explaining the various things they needed to know about being a turbine driver. He was also the one they would call for help in case something went wrong with the turbine car while they had it. The cars were relatively low maintenance, but Carey still received a few late-night phone calls, forcing him to fly in a moment's notice to perform a repair on a failed turbine. Each family got the use of the turbine car for three months. The users were chosen from a broad set of criteria so that pretty much every demographic was represented. Users were young, old, professional, students. They represented a good cross-section of the car-buying public, and many of them reported similar experiences. Once they got their car, they became local celebrities. Newspapers and television stations often ran stories on them. People would approach them and ask to see the car. Many of the users spent an inordinate amount of time giving rides to friends and strangers who were curious about the futuristic car. Not all of the turbine cars were lent to the public. Two were sent to the New York World's Fair, where Chrysler had set up a small track. Fairgoers could get a ride in the turbine, and lines for the attraction were quite long. A few others had been set aside for engineering studies and were even driven on college tours, where Chrysler engineers took them to help recruit engineering students. One car went on a world tour where it visited London, Paris, Australia, and any place Chrysler thought the car might make an impression. Years later, many people fondly recall seeing a Chrysler turbine car at the World's Fair, a college, or even in traffic. The cars lent to users logged over a million miles in the hands of 203 different families. Capitalizing on the publicity, Chrysler made small models of the turbine cars and gave them away as premiums at car dealers. Today, those models are collector's items and can frequently be found on eBay. Overall, the public's reaction to the car was generally positive, but some users had complaints. The car did not accelerate as quickly as some of its contemporaries, but this was something which Huebner felt could be solved. The fuel economy was also not as good as a piston engine, but the automotive turbine was still quite young. With more time to develop the engine, Huebner and his staff were confident the turbine could be made competitive with a piston engine. After logging more than a million miles, the Ghia turbine cars were rounded up and brought back to Chrysler. When the cars had been imported from Italy, Chrysler had the choice of importing them and paying a full import duty on the 55 bodies, or they could save money by paying only for a temporary import fee, such as the one paid for cars which are brought into the country for races or car shows. Chrysler opted to pay the temporary fee since Chrysler had no intention of keeping the cars around forever. Most car companies do not keep their prototypes, and Chrysler was no exception. Chrysler announced that some cars would be saved if museums wanted them. Three would be saved by Chrysler. The rest would be destroyed to avoid the penalty which would be incurred by overstaying the temporary import. A few museums accepted the offer. The rest of the cars had their engines removed and were taken to a scrapyard in Romulus, Michigan. There, with movie cameras documenting the destruction, the Italian-made Chrysler turbine cars were crushed and burned. The turbine cars had proven to be reliable in the hands of the American consumer, and Chrysler had even begun examining the possibility of putting the cars into production. It was briefly considered as a possible engine option in a 1966 model, but higher-ups in Chrysler realized that even with a short run of perhaps only 500 cars, a massive investment would be required in training and in supplying the parts for warranty and service. The consumer turbine was put on hold, but the development would continue just on a smaller scale. While Chrysler's turbine engineers continued ironing out the bugs with the turbine, the company hit a financial rough patch. Gasoline prices skyrocketed, and for the first time, American consumers began looking for smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. Chrysler had none in the pipeline. Chrysler focused on revamping its product line to compete with the imports and had little time or money to spend on launching a revolutionary new car into the marketplace. Many Americans also became concerned about smog and pollution, particularly the kind which could be attributed to cars and their tailpipe emissions. In 1970, the government announced new tailpipe emission standards. One of the pollutants being measured was the oxides of nitrogen. Due to the nature of how turbines work, their oxides of nitrogen emissions, often called NOx, were substantially higher than those of piston engines. While the big three scrambled to resolve the tailpipe emissions with the piston engine, the turbine engineers knew there was little they could do about these NOx emissions, at least when the turbine was running on gasoline. People realized that the turbine had one advantage that would have sidestepped many of the issues the auto industry is now facing. 
The turbine could run on anything that burned. The multi-fuel capability meant that the turbine could run on alcohol, kerosene, diesel fuel, or even vegetable oil. Chrysler even demonstrated the turbine cars being run on peanut oil and tequila. Some of the alternatives would have lower emissions than gasoline burning engines. The federal government, however, set its tailpipe standards to rigid benchmarks, which were designed for gasoline burning engines, and stipulated what kinds of fuels the engines had to run during the tests. The turbines could not compete with different fuels as the feds would not allow it. The turbine engineers continued their testing and experimentation, improving many of the things which people had complained about with the earlier turbines. Fuel economy and performance improved with each generation, but the end was in sight. Chrysler couldn't afford to keep pouring money into George Huebner's pet project. Chrysler teetered on the edge of bankruptcy in 1979 and was forced to go to Washington to appeal for a bailout. Chrysler was almost a billion dollars in debt and blamed some of it on the cost of compliance with the new tailpipe standards. The government agreed to the loan, but part of the agreement called for Chrysler to tighten its spending. Experiments with non-traditional power plants would no longer be so easily funded. Chrysler obtained a Department of Energy grant to develop one last turbine engine as a potential answer to the problems facing the American auto industry at the time. With that funding, Chrysler put its seventh generation turbine into a couple of cars. Compared to the earlier versions, this engine was a masterpiece. Among other things, some of its internal parts were made from ceramic. The last turbine built by Chrysler was the most efficient and cleanest burning, but its cost to manufacture would still have been prohibitive when compared to a traditional piston engine. In 1983, the program ended. It had been 25 years since the first turbine car had rolled out in front of a bank of reporters in Highland Park. Although turbine cars had been successfully built, perhaps as many as 77, and driven by consumers, Chrysler would focus itself entirely on building piston engine cars. The cars would be smaller and meet emission standards mandated by the EPA. They would not be turbine powered. Of the 55 turbine cars built for the user program, 46 were destroyed. At the time, Chrysler donated six to museums and kept three. One of the museum cars was subsequently sold to a collector in Indiana, and Chrysler sold one of its three cars to Jay Leno. Chrysler still has two of the cars, and there are turbine cars at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the Peterson Museum in L.A. The St. Louis Museum of Transportation has one, as does the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. The Detroit Historical Museum also owns one, which is currently on display at the Gilmore Car Museum near Kalamazoo, Michigan. To see a turbine car today requires a trip to one of these museums, and the car you will see most likely will not be one that is drivable. Chrysler takes its turbine car to shows from time to time, and often drives it around so that people can see and hear it run. There's also a possibility you might see one of the two privately owned turbine cars on the road, but if you do, it would be quite a rare sighting. Imagine that. Something which is so rare today was a common sight 50 years ago.